tonight I'm going to discuss some of the environmental mercury issues um, faced by Great Salt Lake ecosystems. And some of this information is coming from uh, a chapter Dr. Frank Black and I wrote together titled Mercury Bioaccumulation and Biomagnification in Great Salt Lake Ecosystems. So you might be wondering uh, what is so unique about the environmental mercury problem at Great Salt Lake. Most of the time when we talk about mercury toxicity, the concerns revolve around humans and the fish they consume. But it's a little different at the Great Salt Lake because the high salinity levels preclude fresh fish from living in the majority of the lake. But what our lake lacks in fish, it makes up for in birds. And that is where most um, of our mercury toxicity concerns lie in Great Salt Lake ecosystems. It's with birds and their prey, which are primarily brine flies and brine shrimp. Um, and the reason that elevated mercury levels in the Great Salt Lake ecosystem is such a big concern is that in addition to the 176 bird species who reside at Great Salt Lake, millions of additional birds stop here to feed along their biannual migratory pathways. So this isn't just a local problem for local birds, um, but elevated mercury levels in Great Salt Lake ecosystems pose a threat to birds throughout North America. So our concerns for elevated mercury levels in Great Salt Lake began around 2005 when a Utah Department of Health survey revealed that three species of ducks, cinnamon teal, common golden eye, and the northern shoveler had muscle mercury concentrations above EPA screening limits, prompting the first consumption advisory to waterfowl and additional studies on mercury levels in Great Salt Lake waters. Soon, it was found that Great Salt Lake waters contain some of the highest methylmercury concentrations ever measured in a natural body of water. The 2005 Utah Department of Health survey also prompted the first waterfowl consumption advisory. Um, following these findings, additional research um, on Great Salt Lake, or mercury cycling in the Great Salt Lake and bioaccumulation in Great Salt Lake ecosystems began including studying mercury levels in brine flies, brine shrimp, spiders, and other birds. I'll discuss some of those findings later in the presentation, but, but next I'm going to discuss mercury toxicity in general and also the global mercury cycle. And we'll zoom back in on Great Salt Lake. So mercury is a toxic heavy metal and it is an environmental pollutant. It can exist as elemental mercury, inorganic divalent mercury, and organomercury compounds, the most important of which is methylmercury. Out of these three um, chemical species, methylmercury is most concerning as an environmental pollutant because when ingested, it's quickly absorbed. Its accumulation rate is much faster than its rate of elimination. And methylmercury is the only form of mercury that is consistently biomagnified in food webs. Sometimes we also refer to total mercury, which is a more general measurement that doesn't distinguish between these three uh, different species. So the harmful effects of mercury are often greatest in young developing organisms like these adorable ducklings. In humans, the greatest health concerns are related to contaminated fish consumption by susceptible populations, including pregnant women and children. Mercury consumption by pregnant women has been linked to neurological and developmental deficiencies in the developing fetus. For other organisms, such as piscivarious birds and mammals, as well as predatory fish, um, these organisms often have high body burdens of mercury due to the biomagnification of methylmercury up the food chain. For birds in particular, sublethal levels of methylmercury can affect behavior, coordination, reproduction, and immune response. Okay. And then um, this is a quick overview of the global mercury cycle. So mercury can uh, exist in the atmosphere as well as in aquatic and terrestrial systems. The majority of atmospheric mercury is elemental mercury and mercury can enter the atmosphere through volcan volcanic eruptions, evasion from oceans, but most importantly from anthropogenic sources. So about two thirds of atmospheric mercury um, originates from some kind of human source. 
um, mercury can then move back into aquatic or terrestrial environments through direct dry deposition as elemental mercury, or it can first transition to a divalent inorganic mercury and then proceed through wet or dry deposition. All right, so back to the lake. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's so unique about um, mercury cycling in the Great Salt Lake. But first, just a couple of background facts to guide us. So our lake is divided into a north and south arm by a railroad causeway that creates um, or leaves us with Gunnison Bay and Gilbert Bay. Those two bays have very different salinity levels. Our railroad causeway does have culverts, um, which allow water to move from the north arm to the south arm. And that water uh, in the north arm is more saline and more dense. So when it enters the south arm, it sinks and creates this deep brine layer. Uh, there's also an upper brine layer above it. And this is also one of Johanna's illustrations. She'll have some uh, food webs later in this talk as well. Okay. Frank's adding some illustrations. Thank you, Frank. It's always good to have a buddy system. Okay, so we don't know exactly why mercury levels are elevated in the Great Salt Lake, but there's a few unique features of our lake that we suspect might be contributing. Uh, and it was likely a combination of lower rates of mercury loss systems and increased rates of mercury inputs. Um, so to start, Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake, which means it lacks um, riverine outputs. And that um, having riverine outputs can act as a loss mechanism for mercury in lakes. And um, other lakes though, other large lakes similar to Great Salt Lake don't rely entirely on riverine outputs though. Um, they also lose mercury through revolatilization to the atmosphere or through burial into the sediment. So it's unlikely that um, the fact that Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake is the most important factor for um, our elevated mercury levels. Great Salt Lake's historical and contemporary global atmospheric mercury input is pretty similar to other lakes, um, with the exception that we do have some upwind gold and mercury mining in California and Nevada which may contribute some local atmospheric mercury input to Great Salt Lake. Also, our lake has a shallow bathometry, which means it has a large surface, surface area to volume ratio, um, which may increase the amount of atmospheric mercury deposition into the lake. Um, and then this next one is a little bit more speculative. We don't really have numbers to support this, but I think it's an especially unique feature of Great Salt Lake, so I wanted to mention it. With some of the mineral extraction activity around Great Salt Lake, especially the magnesium extraction um, creates chlorine gas and bromine that can sit above the lake. And it's been speculated that that unique atmospheric chemistry may also promote atmospheric deposition of mercury into the lake. Um, but what seems to be the most significant feature of Great Salt Lake likely contributing to mercury accumulation is the deep brine layer and the sulfur reducing bacteria who live there. So our deep brine layer is an anoxic environment with high concentrations of sulfate and organic materials and high activity of sulfate reducing bacteria. And all of these factors are known to increase microbial mercury methylation. Um, and the deep brine layer ends up relating to the food webs in the Great Salt Lake because there are mixing events between deep brine layer and the upper brine layer, which provide nutrients for phytoplankton, which are at the base of one of the Great Salt Lake food webs. Unfortunately, this also facilitates the transport of methylmercury into the upper brine layer, where it can be assimilated into Great Salt Lake food webs. Okay, so our Great Salt Lake has two loosely related aquatic food webs. One is a phytoplankton-based food web, which supports our brine shrimp. The second is a benthic algae and detritus-based food web, which also includes the microbialites, and that supports the brine flies. So both those organisms, our brine flies and brine shrimp, are considered keystone species for Great Salt Lake food webs. And, um, Mercury concentrations are highest in adult brine flies and brine shrimp compared to other life stages. 
with the brine shrimp fists and eggs having 90% lower mercury concentrations than the adults who produce them. Um, another, I think, important note about um, mercury levels in the brine flies is that they have some seasonal variability with two maxima in the late spring and early fall. Unfortunately, those maxima correspond with um, the peaks in numbers of migratory birds visiting the Great Salt Lake. But the minimum mercury, methyl mercury concentrations are found in brine flies during the summer. And fortunately, that does correspond to when most breeding and nesting occurs, which could um, give some of our, our fledgling and nesting birds a break from those elevated or from the yeah, mercury levels in brine flies. Um, and it's important to understand both of these food webs because it has been shown that birds who feed primarily on brine flies and birds who feed primarily on brine shrimp both have elevated mercury concentrations. All right, so what else do we know about the birds at this point? Um, elevated mercury levels found in abandoned or unsuccessful legs eggs around the Great Salt Lake do suggest that uh, mercury has negatively imp impacted the reproductive success of birds at Great Salt Lake. Also, um, blood mercury concentrations measured in birds around the western United States also suggest that Great Salt Lake is a mercury exposure hotspot for birds. Um, and it's also been suggested that elevated selenium levels in birds facilitate um, intracellular binding of mercury by the selenium, which may reduce mercury toxicity for these birds. Um, and I think that's just an interesting fact to share because there is some protective effect of having elevated levels of both of these trace elements. Okay, so that covers most of our aquatic food webs and our water uh, fowl and shorebirds. But unfortunately, our elevated mercury levels also impact the surrounding ecosystems of Great Salt Lake. So brine flies are prey to other organisms living in the surrounding terrestrial environment, including many spiders, uh, one of which is a fan favorite, the orb weaver, and um, lizards. Those lizards and spiders then become prey to small mammals and birds, including the loggerhead shrike which is a predatory songbird. And you might be thinking, what do you mean that songbird's predatory? It's so darn cute. These guys are ruthless killers. They will actually impale their prey on barbed wire fences or any thorns they find. So next time you think about calling the loggerhead shrike cute, you may want to think again. Um, spiders are an important part of the diets for many nestling or fledgling birds, and songbirds have been observed to prey on spiders and feed them to their young. Um, so unfortunately, the mercury contamination at Great Salt Lake could represent another stressor to the declining song songbird populations across the United States. Finally, our, bird, our book does focus on Great Salt Lake, a terminal lake in the time of change. So I'd like to address um, a couple of changes we, we might see uh, going forward, mostly focused on a decreased lake level. So with changes in snowpack and precipitation, as well as increased diversion of fresh waters um, due to a growing human population in northern Utah and along the Wasatch Front, we do expect to see decreased lake levels over time. This could result in some decreased input of mercury from atmospheric deposition if there's less surface area of the lake, but we also expect that um, more sediment exposed um, could create a lot of dust similar to what we saw in Owens Lake. And because the sediment of Great Salt Lake also has elevated mercury concentrations, we would expect that dust to be uh, laden with mercury and other heavy metals. We might also expect to see changes to the deep brine layer, similar to what happened when um, those culverts were closed. So a decreasing lake volume, we would expect to see also a decreasing deep brine layer volume and maybe even a disappearance of the deep brine layer. So similar to what happened with the culverts, we would expect um, to have lower mercury levels in the deep waters of the south arm of the lake, but we wouldn't necessarily expect to see 
lower mercury levels in the biota around Great Salt Lake. Um, also, as more and more people move here, we would expect to see some increased anthropogenic mercury generation. Um, and that could come from both increased wastewater input into the Great Salt Lake or some more um, sources of atmospheric mercury input. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks everybody for zooming in.